Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the WWS. My name is Dr. Andrew Chi, a research fellow here at the Institute. Uh, let me welcome you uh, to this session uh, or discussion with Dr. Malte Brozek. Uh, Malte is an associate professor at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, working in the Department of International Relations for the last 10 years, and specializes in African security and regional organizations. Uh, Malte has extensive extensively published on peacekeeping, institutional overlap, and promoting the notion of African security regime. He is the author of the book, The Role of Bricks in Large-Scale Armed uh, Conflict, Building a Multipolar World Order, which he has uh, a copy here. Um, and the topic of Moti's uh, uh, discussion today is Building a Multipolar World, World Order, sorry, The Role of Bricks in Large-Scale Armed Conflict. This event will be on the record, so without further waiting, I'll hand the floor over to Moti. Perfect. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks, everyone, for coming here. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure being here and, and talking about BRICS. I mean, um, how, to, how to start? When you would have asked me like five, six, seven years ago about BRICS, uh, about my opinion, about its importance and relevance and global affairs, I would have said basically, ah, this is totally hyped stuff, you know, this is, <laughs> we're following a big trend. Maybe there is potential and so on, but let's wait and see uh, uh, a little bit. And of course, there was uh, a couple of years ago, there was a big hype in and around BRICS. And now we almost see the opposite. So it's getting much more silent in and around it. Are we having around 10 or 11 years of BRICS right now? And as I'm living in South Africa, uh, we had the big BRICS summit uh, last year in Johannesburg. And of course, when these events come to your city, um, there's a big push and pull from uh, government and you get encouraged to do a little bit more research <laughs> on it and I could participate in the academic forum um, uh, in, in, uh, for, the, for the preparation and this is how I gradually got into it because you're right, I'm basically doing a lot of research on institutions, peace and security in, in Africa. And so BRICS was not my first topic. Uh, but. As you really grow into that organization, or it's a grouping actually, it's not an organization, it was really interesting how it also works from, from the inside. And you get a feeling that, okay, it is a very loose grouping first of all, but there is growing substance. Uh, and there is growing, there is growing together. By the way, a few statistics. Um, I was looking at um, the official calendar of events from, from last year. Uh, as South Africa was hosting not just the summit of all events, and it was 117 events throughout the year. The BRICS is not just the summit, so this is what we usually get in terms of the declaration, the heads of state meeting, and maybe the foreign ministers meeting, and a few high level meetings here and there. There is much, much more um, than this. So, de facto, you have like every second day there would be a BRICS meeting. <laughs> on a whole range of topics. Um, I'm only focusing on issues of uh, peace and security. Reason being also is that I think there was enough talk about the economic side, the new development bank and so on, um, but the peace and security side is also increasingly interesting. So you, you, we know that BRICS as such doesn't really have much act in this. So it's not an organization that doesn't have a secretariat or a secretary general. And much really um, depends on how countries or the BRICS or the group is actually responding to um, conflicts out there. And this is um, how I see the issue of world order. Not so much, it's not only about um, the change in uh, global governance institutions, which they call for in the IMF and World Bank and so on and so forth, but it's also very much action based and behavior based. How do you respond to big crises? Of, um, of our time. And there, I think the point of the book is then that, yeah, the BRICS are making a pretty specific contribution um, to these conflicts and how they, how they respond. And through that response, you're actually also creating something like order, which is much more fluent, of course. It's changing. It's very flexible. <laughs> um, uh, it's not written in a constitution and, and so on and so forth. Um, that's the that's the um, basic idea. Um, I can. Is it okay if I pass yeah. around the book? Um, I'm not responsible for the cover. Most people think this looks like an alien invasion or <laughs> some kind of Death Star. <laughs> so not my not my idea. It's a corporate design, so I just had to accept it as it is. <laughs> I'll pass that around if you want to have a look um, here. Um, 
Okay, so this a little bit as a as a back uh, as a background. I think one of the key questions we have to start with basic stuff here, right? I uh, hope not to bore you, but uh, <laughs> one of the basic questions is really how does brick how does it work? Uh, and I think there are two sides uh, that we have to look at. One could be the more official way, the what is codified. Okay, there's no constitution of it, obviously. There's no founding treaty. It's not a treaty organization. Again, it is a foreign policy grouping. Foreign policy grouping also means that you can only agree on stuff that is agreeable among all members of, um, of BRICS. Um, so in that regard, it's pretty, conser it's pretty conservative. And what you find in the summit declarations, um, as it's not so surprising maybe, it's um, a strong, very strong emphasis on sovereign equality, so sovereignty principle. Um, okay, you have reference to a rules-based international um, order, you have especially a very strong reference to the primacy of the UN Security Council, so whatever action is taken it has to go through the Security Council. Um, not so surprising thinking about China and Russia being permanent members and um, Russia and China are also permanently afraid about action that's taken um, um, outside the council here. So that's one explanation for uh, why we have that strong emphasis on the, on the council. Um, very strong opposition against unilateral Western military intervention. This is something that came up extremely strongly um, with the conflict in Libya. Um, by the way, in the book I'm looking at four conflicts here and how BRICS are responding. There would be Libya, Syria, Ukraine and South Sudan. These are large-scale conflicts, so they are very meaningful. Okay? I'll, I could have also used maybe Yemen, but at some point it was a little bit too late to also have that other chapter uh, in, the, in, in, in there. Yeah, so the unilateral Western military intervention is something that is absolutely... Um, and now where you find absolute opposition of, um, uh, of the BRICS grouping and where there is really unity in, in positions. In many other positions, they are not so unified, right, uh, here. Um, they are promoting, of course, a non-Western identity, as you can see. Uh, obviously, these are all non-Western countries. And this shines through from time to time um, here, so it's more third-worldish developmental perspective that uh, comes through. And, of course, also a strong favor for multipolarity uh, simply because these are large regional powers and of course it's in their own advantage to have a more decentralized uh, world order uh, emerging somehow. So this is all pretty much classical stuff you find in every summit declarations uh, for, the, for the last 10 years. But maybe more interesting would be the unwritten rules and that takes actually some time also to, to recognize how it works from the, from the, from, from the, in, uh, from the inside here. Okay, the sovereignty first principle, you really feel that in all BRICS meetings, um, although uh, we are as academics only so-called track two. So track one uh, would be heads of states, track two is an academic think tank environment, track three would be civil society, although I doubt that it really exists within the BRICS framework as such and the official uh, BRICS uh, um, uh, framework. But you know, our um, academic um, forum declaration in the end also has to go through the summit and needs to find approval of heads of states at the highest level, so it goes through Sherpas and so on and so forth. Um, although we can be a little bit more innovative, and what we achieved in South Africa last year was that there is reference now to the setting up of a um, research institute on peace and security. If that comes really into existence, <laughs> is also a question if other countries follow up with Brazil. I'm not so convinced that they have a keen interest in, in BRICS at the, at the moment with Bolsonaro. Um, we'll see. But the NDB was first mentioned in the Development Bank in 2013, and now it's in place. So uh, give that thing five to six years and we will, we will see. But at least it was there and heads of states agreed uh, to it. The other thing, uh, just to finish up on South Africa, uh, was also that the South Africa promoted the idea of a peacekeeping working group. This has not met so far. But you can see with China, Russia being in the Security Council and uh, South Africa being a prominent African member, there might be some space for better coordination in, on, on, on that topic um, as, um, as well. Okay, so what are the 
um, informal rules. Sovereignty first, I mean, this is really important. Um, it's not just sovereignty, of course, different people understand sovereignty in different ways. Um, the understanding of BRICS is very much uh, sovereignty internationally should be unconstrained, basically. So you do try to do everything to avoid external interferences in what you define as, um, as sovereignty. It's a very state-led process, the whole, uh, the whole grouping here. Okay, what you also do not have um, or is not really wanted and is difficult is really openly criticizing uh, other members. So you don't kick them where it hurts, which would be very easily possible to do <laughs> uh, when you see uh, India-China border contestation and other issues um, that that come uh, that that come up. But this is uh, clearly this is clearly avoided. Um, interesting also is the mutual acceptance of um, key national interests, and uh, we can gradually see also something like a carving out of regional backyards, which are more or less accepted. And how does this work? So when we take the, crisis, uh, the, um, the war in the Ukraine and uh, annexation of, of, of Crimea, you find that the BRICS did not sanction Russia, but they also didn't endorse Russian action um, for many reasons. Uh, but tacitly, you know, it is an acceptance that the Ukrainian issue is almost treated like a domestic Russian issue in the end. The same way as one would accepted that Kashmir is of essential importance for India and BRICS would not take any official statement on Kashmir that the Indians would certainly not like to see it. On the other hand, you actually have reference to specific terror groups um, uh, in, the, in the summit declaration and this is because India wants reference to these particular terror groups, which is very specific. So if you really single out a specific terror groups, you see that BRICS somehow wants to position itself towards issues of peace and security. We haven't seen that in the early years. This is coming over the last uh, couple of years. Um, just one footnote when it comes to the big summit declarations. You know, if you go through the list of conflicts they mention, this list is long. This list is really long. It's maybe, I don't know, 40, 50 conflicts. So they're taking positions, at least diplomatically, rhetorically, on many, 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 many <coughs> conflicts. So it implies that they want to have at least um, some activeness. Uh, they want to take positions on, on, on these issues. Okay. You, do not all, you also do not talk about domestic problems, you do not talk about South African corruption uh, of the Zuma government, uh, you do not talk uh, about Uyghurs uh, in China, you do not talk about uh, Hindu uh, nationalism in India, and so on and so forth. Uh, or how Michel Timer came to power, which wasn't so constitutional <laughs> after all. All these you do not really talk about in order to provide a more cozy and safe environment for leaders to portray themselves in a very positive light, uh, um, of course. Um, the other, and that's the last point, is also important, is that uh, BRICS is not seen as a strategic alliance. Uh, it's not the NATO of the South or something uh, like this. Uh, this kind of um, language is simply simply not used. Uh, you should rather see it uh, as a kind of follow-up or modern update of the Bandung conference, the non-alignment movement. So uh, they really try to avoid this typical thinking in terms of coalitions for and against. So this is also the attempt to not take a position very, uh, very often, not to get drawn into dogfights, uh, for, for instance. And it's, although it's a non Western uh, grouping, it is not an anti-Western, it's not per se an anti-Western uh, uh, um, alliance here. So that would be, I think, a, a, a misreading. Okay, so this is a little bit as, as a basic background how the grouping uh, might actually work. Okay, now coming to the questions, how do BRICS actually respond to these four big um, conflicts. I can't really go into all of them because it's really empirically rich um, here, but maybe in the Q&A I can single out South Sudan or Ukraine and we can talk about it a little, little bit more. But here the first question would also be, you know, what are the options? And I'm drawing from literature on uh, regional leadership and I'm singling out like six types of responses, macro ideal types of course, 
um, that are possible. So if we start with cooperative response to a crisis, that could be active or passive. So um, cooperative means basically you acting within existing frameworks of multilateralism. So you go to the UN, you try to send out a mediation team. You are not a part, not a party to the conflict itself. So and you are acting within legal constraints that international law basically uh, basically provides you or you're going to a regional organization. Right? You can initiate the whole thing or you're just lending support to it saying okay we are supporting <laughs> the Minsk agreement in the, in, in the Ukraine. Or uh, the other option would be more hegemonic approach here uh, distinguished between leading and, and dominant so here we're not speaking so much about multilateralism and it's much more coalition building, mini-lateralism, which would be more strategic and purposeful. So you gather around uh, some friends that support you and you have clear strategic vision of what you, uh, you want to do. You can maybe support proxies within war, so you're not completely neutral and you use hegemonic power you have maybe as a Security Council member with veto or other military economic means, sanctions and so on, that would be uh, possible. Or on the more extreme side then, the most coercive one would be neo-imperialist behavior, where I distinguish between temporary and, and, and permanent and direct, so we have here more the unilateral, the intention is the unilateral use of force. Uh, force can mean different things, doesn't necessarily need to mean military force, economic sanctions and so on, political um, um, as well. But here you're trying to um, really uh, play out power politics. Uh, the extreme version could be the, the permanent um, uh, occupation of, of, of territory. We don't see that very often, but we have seen it in the case of Russia and Crimea, for, um, for, for example. So important is that you're really being a party to the conflict. There's no intention of being neutral and trying to solve the conflict um, as such. So these are the ideal ideal types. Um, the other thing is, and this is what the literature often does not do, is the question is then for me, now how can we explain the selection of a particular response type to, to, to a particular conflict? And then I'm openly going through like six conditions that I thought somehow make sense. So uh, at the beginning I have no idea what is actually the killer variable. So I actually assume that it's a mix of different conditions that comes together here. And one is, I mean, and, and I'm actually not extremely innovative here, so I'm going through very classical arguments. And one would be, okay, the closer you are to conflict, maybe the stronger the response. Simply because you are affected by the conflict, you cannot just afford to do nothing. Uh, but proximity these days, um, we have to see it in a smarter way. It's not just about miles away from a conflict, <laughs> um, but uh, it's much more a question of interconnectivity. So if we see Chinese investment in Africa, also in Latin America, the Chinese are invested, uh, I think, the most of all countries uh, in, on, on the African continent. And that also means they are affected by all conflicts that break out on the African continent. They cannot escape. They cannot escape it. Huh? So um, the question is again, you know, how interconnected are you? And if you see like there are a million Chinese nationals on the African continent, there are a million Indian nationals, so this becomes an issue of almost national security very quickly at some point. And we've seen these issues coming up uh, with China in Libya, where they had to evacuate 30,000 nationals. And that was really in Beijing, it was debating around well, what are we doing, how can we protect our people and so on. Um, so this we have to keep in mind here uh, as well when we speak about proximity. And the next one argument is a very classical realist argument. Well, if you respond to a conflict you need to have capacity. If you don't have any capacity you can't do, you can't do anything. Uh, as, simple, as simple as that. And with capacity here, I really also mean military uh, capacity uh, in, the, in, 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 the first, uh, in the first place, be it for peacekeeping or be it to use like a conventional army to invade another country. You know, it would be like, it's a huge range, of course, that we can uh, um, talk about. But capacity, I mean, counting tanks is something that is a little bit uh, useless if there is no strategic thinking for how would you use your power resources. If that simply doesn't exist, then the, re then the resources also don't have that much meaning. So it has to be combined with the will to act. So is there a strategic plan for the Chinese in South Sudan? 
or the Russians in uh, in Ukraine and so on and so forth uh, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, number three would be type of conflict. So maybe it doesn't matter um, how l I'm simply saying large the conflict is. So is it a conflict that really touches upon global order questions? And I think if we talk about Syria, then this is almost like a mini World War Three. Uh, you have so many proxies, uh, and it goes far, far beyond uh, um, Syria that um, the conflict itself becomes so meaningful. It's difficult not to respond in one way or um, or the other. Whereas on the other extreme could be maybe a conflict like South Sudan, which is at the core of the conflict in South Sudan. It's really the leadership uh, contestation uh, within uh, the uh, party SPLM. And this then, there's a certain regional dimension to it, but it's somehow smaller in, in, in extent. So it's not that large powers might feel the urge to respond in the, in, in the first place. So that's a different type of um, conflict. Number four, I find personally the, somehow the most interesting. Okay? Economic interest, yeah, they, they certainly play a role. That we know. Um, and I'm speaking about FDI, natural resources, uh, trade patterns, market access, and so on, uh, which is important either if you're an export or import nation, um, of course, developing nation or more developed nation. Um, this still counts. But the question is, what would that trigger? On the one hand, you can argue in both ways. Okay, Are the Chinese becoming more militarized in their responses to conflict because they are invested? Or would they rather use more regional organizations, in global organizations, to save investment from losing it? Right? In Libya, you can have a long debate. What would be the best option, actually? And in the end, you lost like 20 or 30 billion dollars in, in investment. And uh, uh, would you be able to actually save that investment by intervening militarily? Mm. <laughs> No, that, that's an interesting question to, to actually look at. So um, how do countries respond if they are more invested or which is uh, not so uh, invested in it? Okay, and then the last two points, resonance with the BRICS normative agenda. Of course, there is a BRICS normative agenda, as I tried to say at the beginning. So it's much more about non-alignment, developing countries, multipolarity, not being Western, for instance. So there is a normative uh, story that the BRICS want to uh, wanna sell. And... Um, is the conflict itself suitable to better link up to what BRICS want to achieve normatively, sovereign equality, or is it not? Uh, and then maybe I'm naive, the last point could be maybe countries respond to conflict simply because we have global norms on humanitarian uh, issues uh, that's, that, we can, that we should respond out of moral considerations, that we cannot just watch the conflict um, un unfold. But, you know, um, I can already tell you right now, <laughs> this is the least, least relevant <laughs> um, condition here, um, I'm afraid. Okay, um, quickly, as I said, I cannot go through all chapters and conflicts because it's just too much because we have five BRICS countries and when we have four conflicts, you know, you can talk for, for hours here, that's not possible. But I just want to explain how the chapters work and then go into the main picture um, of it. I was just basically randomly picking Syria here because, yeah, it, it is one of the worst conflicts of, um, of our time. So each chapter then um, identifies what is the response time of the individual country and you can <coughs> You can see here already with the, with the BRICS grouping that um, it's not really that coherent, first of all. You know, giving BRICS a single tag, I think, doesn't really work. They do respond differently in different situations, right? In, individually speaking, at least. Uh, okay, no surprise, Russia would fall into the more neo-imperialist perspective here, so it's really using its military power to establish, redeem itself as a global, almost global power, or, re, or at least in, in, in the Middle East here. Uh, China certainly falls within hegemonic leadership uh, because the use of the V2 power, of course, which is legitimate by the UN Charter, right? Others use it as well, but um, the frequency with, with China, the, the frequency um, with which China was using the um, the veto is historic, right? So in in the Syrian case, that clearly sees that you know they want to use the power resources they have in that in that conflict, and then South Africa, Brazil, India, by the way, IPSA, 
which doesn't really exist anymore. <laughs> I'm afraid that there haven't been many meetings, so it's almost um, it's almost dying. They're taking a much more cooperative perspective. So if you look at and foreign policy statements from South Africa, Brazil, and India, this is much more in line of okay, we are supporting. Uh, uh, the UN mission uh, for, for mediation and, and so on. So that is, takes a different position. There was even an IPSA mediation effort uh, early on in the, uh, in the Syrian conflict. It failed like so many other initiatives failed in, in, in that country. Um, Brazil is also interesting because Brazil, out of all the BRICS countries, was the only one that actually called for criminal prosecution of war crimes. In, in Syria. So that's which is something that Russia would not do, <laughs> maybe just rhetorically, but <laughs> not really with a strong uh, belief. So this is how, how I map the situ situation. I do this for all conflicts and then later on you can see the, the whole picture and that would be the next slide. Of course then it's interesting to see um, how do the input conditions relate to what the countries are doing. And it's very easy to read here. So the more pluses there are the stronger the condition, the more minuses they are, the, the weaker. I'm not really a number cruncher, so I mean, some people tell me, yeah, you can do regression models and so on. <laughs> I'm not so strongly believing in that because I think it's more the story that you have to tell in here, and you lose also detail if you just attach numbers to, to, to issues. Then, uh, uh, but okay, um, yeah. If we just quickly look at Russia and Brazil, because these are the two extremes here. Um, so Russia, new imperialist. Brazil, uh, cooperative, um, active here. Um, you can clearly see so with Russia, okay, in terms of proximity, it's fairly close because of the two military bases, the uh, Black Sea um, uh, suite, uh, um, 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 the fleet was uh, very close to the, to the Syrian coastline, so there was and uh, Islamic terrorism in Russia does pose a particular threat to the country that one has to cite. Um, capabilities and interest, military capabilities were readily available. Interest to you know, make a stand uh, was also there, determination from, from the leadership. Um, type of conflict, Syria ranks very high in terms of global order questions. This is seen by BRICS also as a battleground some, um, somehow, right? And, and there's particularly there's a link to the Libyan case, preventing uh, the Libyan model in Syria. So that was the common position of, um, of BRICS. So Assad has to stay, uh, not like uh, Gaddafi was, uh, was removed um, here. So the type of conflict, yep. Economics for Russia, well, okay, Russia doesn't really sell oil or gas uh, to the country, but it is of certain economic importance. Um, it's not completely irre irrelevant. It was buying weapons, long historic relations with the Soviet Union and so on. So it's not completely irrelevant, but it's also you can't really, Russia doesn't really gain much in terms of billions of contracts or something like this. BRICS agenda somehow, humanitarian norms, not, not really. If we can look at Brazil, you, you see the complete opposite. So it's the most detached. There's no geographical or linkages any other linkages actually to, to, to the country, capabilities and interests. There's no leadership interest to getting involved in this kind of conflict from the Brazilian side. Okay, if it's a conflict on, in South America, that would change the situation. Like Haiti, for instance, Brazilians sending peacekeepers, that was seen as more as a Brazilian issue. Um, but Syria is simply just too far, too far away. And your yeah, capabilities, interests, they're not, they simply do not exist. So you don't have many options to respond then. And the type of conflict we've spoken about, economically, zero. Uh, very close to zero, I would, I would say. BRICS agenda, Brazilians also didn't really feel like that there's a very strong relationship to it. Um, here, humanitarian norms. Yes, Brazil was the only one, as I said, that was actively also promoting the idea of criminal prosecution of war crimes. Other BRICS countries did not do this. So this humanitarian mind, at least for Brazil, was there. Okay, so I'm doing the same thing then for all the other conflicts. So it's a little bit of um, quick wrapping up. So what situation do we do we see overall? So it's uh, for the number of cases. So it's in the end, it's then 20 cases. So four conflicts, five countries, that makes uh, 20 uh, cases. And what you see is that, yeah, overall from the 20 cases, you have 17 cases that would fall within more cooperative behavior. This is, on the one hand, 
Um, the passive ones is basically going along with existing initiatives where you simply make reference to the Arab League, to uh, the Normandy format, to uh, the United Nations in this or that, con uh, this or that conflict. Uh, this is actually the, do the most frequent response is rather cooperative and rather passive. So. Um, but there's also some action, uh, some activity is there um, uh, as well. Um, as I mentioned in Syria, the uh, IPSA countries were starting a mediation effort um, somehow. And um, uh, yeah, China is also very active, for instance, when it comes to South Sudan, um, taking a much more proactive role than in the past, where they're just watching and do, making little contributions. But here it was a significant contribution. Maybe not the only one, maybe not the most significant, but it was um, clearly, clearly there. Um, what's also interesting is that you see the difference between IPSA and the rest. That is pretty massive. So when it comes to stronger responses which are a little bit outside the existing multilateral frameworks, then we are speaking first of all about Russia in Ukraine and Syria, as well as about China in, in, in the Syrian case. But there's the difference between IPSA and Russia and China is, is quite big. So these are also fundamentally different actors somehow within within the grouping. Um, okay, now this is kind of a killer table, I know. <laughs> well, that's the that's the one rule. That's the one ring that rules them all. So as they say, um, okay, but it's very easy to read. Um, so here I try to look at again, uh, okay, how can we explain what we see, um, basically. So and what is the relative importance of the six different conditions um, uh, that I mentioned, uh, proximity, capability, interest, and so on and so forth. And then the pluses and minuses, you know that, okay, there's the absence of something versus the presence of something. And then you have the numbers up there are the frequency, so how often do we see that? And what is interesting then is that um, those who will respond most cooperatively are also the most detached from the conflict. So the further you are away, um, the more likely it is that you're actually using existing frameworks out there. Maybe it's easier to do huh? because, okay, the UN is out there, the regional organizations are out there, many actors are out there in Africa, the EPSA and so on, and so on. maybe it's just, uh, just easy. Um, uh, to do here, versus when you're responding more strongly, uh, then there's always um, you're very close to the conflict, which should also not be surprising in one way or or, or the other. Okay, why are acting some more cooperatively? Yeah, okay, they are far away. Like Brazil is the example; it's always far away from all the conflicts. Well, that's the reason why Brazilian foreign policy might appear as very passive. <laughs> Not only for the internal for inter reasons, and of course there was domestic uh, unrest and so forth over the last years, but maybe simply there was no compelling reason to do much. And the end. then also, yeah, what makes you more cooperative might also be the absence of really capabilities to do to do much, right? So that also brings you much closer to the regional frameworks and global and global frameworks. With those who have capabilities and are close to the conflict, uh, there we see a link Russia in, in the first place to also become more assertive or use more coercive means to get involved here. Um, that would be, yep, so the closer you are somehow the stronger um, the response. I'm not going to all the other ones because um, the idea of this table is to find out what are the conditions that really count. In many other situations like type of conflict you have like different responses. Well that means it's causally not so relevant. So if something causes some uh, two different responses then you can't really say is that condition important or not. So therefore I'll leave aside quite, quite a lot here. Economics now is really is, is an important one. On the one hand, it looks very inconclusive in terms of, okay, there are countries that have interests, economic interests, and we can look at India and South Sudan. India is fairly heavily invested in <coughs> South Sudan, billions. They need oil to run their own economy to grow, so this is a national priority to grow out of poverty. Um, they have even having 3,000 soldiers in South Sudan uh, within uh, the peacekeeping mission. That's the largest national 
uh, contingent of, of all the nations there. And as a risky mission, people are really dying, not only civilians, but also peacekeepers. So India is somehow a strange case because you, have, you, you would tick all the classical boxes of interest, relevance, capabilities, but they're not playing an active role. They could, even diplomatically, but um, India recognized South Sudan like half a year later than the rest of the world somehow. So they, <laughs> they don't really feel compelled to, um, to um, take action. On the other hand, then we have countries like China who are also heavily invested in South Sudan. And here it seems to be the classical link that, okay, you have clear interest, and they just discovered new oil uh, in, in South Sudan, so, um, uh, and therefore they're becoming more active militarily and on, the diplomatic, uh, on, and on the diplomatic front. It was only through China in the Security Council that they agreed on an arms ban, that the arms ban was implemented, and then after that, actually, the peace agreement kind of uh, worked. So they're pay playing a much more active role than they've played in the, in the past. So that looks like inconclusiveness somehow. So on the one hand, some countries, more economic interest lead to more, I would say, hands-on, direct uh, interventionist approach maybe. In the case of India, that's not the case. It's a little bit inconclusive, but what's interesting here is, okay, maybe if it's not the presence of economic interest, maybe it's the absence. What does the absence do? <laughs> And here the picture somehow seems to be clearer in a way um, that all those countries who don't really have any economic uh, connections, they always respond more cooperatively within existing frameworks. But for those who have economic interest, you have different responses here. At least that's an interesting um, finding, I thought. Uh, maybe but I'm, I'm only an academic, so maybe I'm the only one who finds that <laughs> exciting here. Um, other issues like BRICS agenda, humanitarian concerns, um, conflict types, in the end, I think they are not so terribly relevant. And is there a last slide? You, you skipped the hypothesis. Um, ah, sorry. So, sorry? No, we can talk about that. Yeah. Okay, because, yeah. Uh, that's a shame, so I have to look it out in my book. If we are formulating hypotheses, which I've basically already done, uh, is that, okay, the closer you are to the conflict um, and the more capabilities you have available, um, the more likely a stronger response is. Uh, you found this too academic. Um. Just to round it up, and then I am done. Just the first three, yeah. So, um, okay, the book goes through, uh, because this is classical uh, academic hypothesis testing, the book goes through a number of hypotheses, but I just want to speak about the most relevant ones here. So, this is uh, H1 to H3. So this is what we can say is somehow meaningful. The greater the proximity to conflict and the greater the capacity to project power, the stronger or more coercive the response. This is a statement that is generally true if we go through the empirical uh, data and how individual BRICS countries respond. The larger the distance to conflict and more limited capabilities to project power, the more cooperative the response. This is also generally true. So if you're cooperative, you're usually far away from the, uh, from the con uh, conflict and have l limited resources and interest. And then cooperative behavior increases with the absence of economic interest, uh, where the, the presence leads to different responses, so it's a bit inconclusive. The other hypotheses are interesting, but don't want to talk about them right, um, right now. So this is more the nerdy part of uh, being an academic, so you have to come up with some uh, hypothesis in the, in, in the end. Many things I've skipped over while, while talking, of course, uh, there's much more detail uh, in the individual cases, Libya, Syria, Ukraine, and, um, and, um, and South Sudan. I want to finish with saying, okay, where's the overall importance here for BRICS when it comes to a changing global order? There is, there is. First of all, Libya was the founding case. Libya was the case that actually forced and forged BRICS as a foreign policy group. It's so important to understand the response in the, in the Syrian case. And the all, in all other cases, uh, BRICS was 
maybe not blocking, but also, yeah, partly blocking the preferred Western option. So the preferred Western option to Syria, of course, is well known. It's uh, to remove Assad. Um, BRICS, in the end, prevented this. Uh, and it's not that BRICS criticized Russia for doing it. No, no, no. This was tacitly accepting it. Backyards. So it was accepted also as, okay, power politics of Russia, we are fine with it some, um, somehow. Uh, you don't have this criticism, as I said at the beginning. Uh, when, we, when it comes to, to the Ukraine, uh, Russia behaving uh, as a new imperialist power in a very classical manner, even occupying territory. Um, here, BRICS also prevented the preferred Western policy option, and this is isolating Russia and exerting significant economic and diplomatic pressure on the country. BRICS prevented this. By the way, of all, of all BRICS countries where I went to in visiting foreign ministries and, and think tanks, um, uh, the um, quickest response I got from the Russian foreign ministry, within minutes I got interviews and so on. <laughs> um, that tells you something about how isolated the country actually is. They wouldn't necessarily um, promote that <laughs> publicly as well. Don't like to speak about it some, um, somehow, what the country is. And BRICS was a lifeline here. Uh, BRICS is important because these are large powers and of course Russia is smaller powers that would speak in its favor or not criticize it and, and so on. But these internationally don't really count that much. But if you don't get criticized by the larger ones within your peer group, then this, uh, this also counts. So, pre so BRICS prevented then the isolation of, um, of Russia. Um, yeah, they prevented also the... Uh, so um, uh, Russia is still in the um, G20 and so on, also because of BRICS here. Uh, last one, um, South Sudan. It's, it's a completely different conflict, so it's not so much big power um, uh, politics as, in, as in, in, in Syria here, but as I mentioned, the role of China should not be underestimated because China is sitting in the Security Council. It was extremely difficult in the Security Council in New York to agree on any sanction regime. It was only with the Chinese that a tougher sanction regime was actually imposed over time. Americans pushed for that for, for, a, long, for, for a long time. So you can also see that yeah, without BRICS then it would be other results. So all this together I think is pretty, pretty significant. Brilliant. I'll finish on that. Thank you very much. I can see there's questions. Should we just go straight into it? Start here and then start here. If you just start by introducing your, your name, affiliation, please. Uh, Natalie Herbert, uh, King's College, London. Uh, I thank you so much for the uh, wonderful presentation. A lot of uh, interesting insight. First, uh, would it benefit BRICS to become more centralized? And similar to their cooperation in establishing the new development bank, is there a possibility of similar organizations on peace and security issues? Should I okay. Okay. Um, Well, I've got a question and then some observations. I don't think take Natalie's first. How do you want to do it? Okay. Yeah, I can, I can yeah. respond to it because it's an yeah, it's, it's an interest. It's really an interesting question. So what we see is there there's gradual gradually there is more consolidation uh, within BRICS and okay it's not a surprise that in the economic sphere you see that quicker because <laughs> there's more direct benefits to profit from in the end. I mean, on issues of peace and security this is usually more complicated. Again the first principle is, is, is sovereignty above everything else. And that also puts limits on, on cooperation. Um, it, it is um, no secret that Chinese-Indian relations are not the best. They are problematic. Chinese investment in Pakistan is a real problem for for India. And for instance, a, discussing a conflict. So within BRICS, if they make reference to conflicts, they will never make reference to a conflict within BRICS itself. So even if they would cooperate more or integrate more in peace and security, I doubt that there would be higher, more benefits. And I think they are pretty happy with the, co again, it's not a coalition, it's, it's just a grouping. I think there is, a, there is quite significant foreign policy value in having a more loose uh, grouping. Yeah. Um, one example might be uh, where it worked out somehow in 2017 in, in, in Sanya. 
uh, there was a border standoff between India and China. So the summit was coming in a couple of weeks. I think through the summit, uh, because it was too embarrassing to have the two countries <laughs> almost going to war. They pragmatically agreed on, okay, let's not escalate that rather minor skirmish at the, um, at the, at the board, and everyone was happy with it. I don't see any internal dissatisfaction with being a grouping. Uh, and it's a deliberate move and decision not to be an organization. That in itself can also be a value. And sometimes this is, you know, we shouldn't read too much into this, uh, into, all, in, in, into all of this. There can be also a purposeful um, strategic, it can be a purposeful strategic decision to be reluctant and not to act. And it can also be a strategic decision not to form an organization. Because that would form maybe more opposition in the end. And there are issues between BRICS members as well. So if you force them too close together, I think the conflicts might really complicate the working of it. And here you have this cozy, nice environment, and it's fine as it is. At least from the inside, there is no real urge uh, towards it. But, okay, the Peace Institute could be something. Uh, if it, it, would be, it would be an institute, it would be physical, it had would be located somewhere, for for example. The peacekeeping working group can be meaningful uh, for many reasons. We have the security advisors to the heads of states meeting. Uh, this is top secret. You don't get any information what they talk about, but I guess there is intelligence exchange and so on. And where you see more cooperation would also be in anti-terrorism. They are also an anti-terror working group, but this is all so classified that I can't really tell you what's going on. <laughs> Um, my question is, are there any, is there any other defense and security architecture within BRICS, within all those meetings? Um, but I, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm Ben Barry, I'm the Land Warfare Senior Fellow here. So I'm part of the team that produces the ISS Military Balance. Um, I've got two different perspectives. One of them is, I think we should have no illusions that the Indian defense and security establishment sees China as a major threat. It was the driver of their nuclear capability, and all the discussions I have with them suggest that the uh, Indians see increasing Chinese activity in the Indian Ocean as a threat. It's driving their approach to maritime security and their naval modernization program. Um, but my... my it's really quite interesting just to look at the BRICS contribution to peacekeeping. Because you've got China, who's a permanent member of the Security Council, who's actually, you know, there's been a slow but steady increase in the Chinese contribution to UN peacekeeping op 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 operations. China's also a major funder of UN peacekeeping, peacekeeping operations. Brazil has, has been for some time the lead nation of the UN operation in, in Haiti. South Africa, well, if you were to consult recent issues of the, uh, the ISS military balance, you'd see that it has made a contribution to AU operations on the African continent. But actually, its military has degraded so much over the last decade that my judgment is, if it's not careful, it will embark on a death spiral. Then Russia. Russia is actually modernizing their military, and they've acquired considerable operational experience from Ukraine and from Syria and their interest in military is increasingly capable and diplomatically and in terms of troops Russia played a very useful role in the UN mission in, UN and NATO missions in Bosnia in the 90s but at the moment apart from small teams of individuals um, Russia is not pulling any weight militarily or financially at the UN peacekeeping I'm sorry if that's an inconvenient perspective, but it's what you take from the motion Yeah, I would, uh, when it comes to more bricks in, in peace and security internationally, I would actually put my money on peacekeeping. Because, as you said, um, issues between India and, and China are, uh, militarily are, I mean, this is really uh, problematic. Uh, so there was an agreement, gentlemen's agreement, somehow, that you don't, again, 
the internal rules principle, the unwritten constitution, is that you don't really bring in these conflicts into BRICS as a grouping. So you, so you don't talk about it uh, in the end. And my bet on Venezuela, so this is coming up uh, very soon, and the, in the summit in, in, in Brasilia, uh, will also be that if, if Bolsonaro you know, takes a position which is clearly in opposition to Russia and so on, they wouldn't mention it whatsoever, and that's the, that's the easiest, uh, easiest way out. Um, on the peacekeeping, yes, Russia doesn't really uh, put much resources in there, but um, the Russians are increasingly um, you know, scrutinizing mandates, and they're putting pressure on how the peacekeeping operations are designed. Um, to me, that makes sense to coordinate this more with China as the Chinese putting more money, first of all. I mean, the 2,000 Chinese soldiers compared to the 120,000 or 100,000 UN soldiers is, is not massively large, actually, to, 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 to be honest. But the Indian contribution is much larger. So I think there, is, there, there, would, be, there would be a lot of opportunity for better coordination. Uh, here, but unfortunately, I mean, I've asked uh, South African diplomats twice last year, and the first meeting was scheduled for May 2018. It didn't take place simply because there was not enough interest from the rest of the group uh, in peacekeeping. Then it was moved to November, December. There was no meeting, and now it would be on Brazil. But Brazil is more or less a fallout now, so there is. I don't hear much at the um, at, at the moment, so there is no genuine interest. In peacekeeping, uh, so it's, it's difficult. Although the potential would be, would be, um, would be there. Um, just, just a footnote. I mean, BRICS, of course, is one approbation among uh, quite a number of them, and you have um, Russia, India, uh, uh, China, uh, RIC. You have the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization. You, you have IPSA. What makes BRICS different from all of them is that BRICS is not regional. So it's the it's the global dimension. Now this is there is a there's a foreign policy, there's currency in that, and having that global uh, uh, that global dimension. But BRICS then also brings in regional advantages because um, okay, think about how do the Russians respond to Chinese expansion in the South China Sea? Russia does not openly endorse that <laughs> that expansion. This is something that the Indians would feel like okay. <laughs> We have a similar position in, in here, and um, now also increasingly the fact that BRICS does not make any statements about the South China Sea. There is value for India in that, uh, and uh, so you don't want to bring in confrontation and uh, and opposition from the from the, from the outside into the group, and therefore you create a certain certain value. Countries do profit from that in one way or or the other in one conflict. Uh, or um, or the other, and, and I think this also keeps BRICS alive in exactly not bringing this conflict into the group. Although these conflicts do exist, and therefore you know the grouping makes more sense than a hard organization where you fight over you know how is the treaty of what what uh, then actually uh, formulated. Um, sorry, just I want to make sure I don't give people the wrong impression. Um, I would imagine that in South Sudan, the Indian contingent will make a very strong effort to have a fruitfully cooperative attitude to the Chinese contingent. Because to their credit, India and Pakistan, when their contingents are in the same UN operation, all the evidence is that their practical cooperation on the mission is excellent. So I'd expect, it, I'd expect in, in, in Indian troops to try very hard to get on with the Chinese troops. Mm. They're not necessarily in the same location. But sure. we'll <laughs> yeah. but now, South they're, South if they're two contributing nations, there will, for example, be a proportion of the staff officers in the HQ and command centre yes. will be Indian, um, Chinese, and that's exactly the same in the UN mission where they're Indian and Pakistani. The Chinese tend to be in the, uh, in the, in the centre in Juba, sure. and uh, Indians are more in the periphery, so Malacca, Bentu, Wow. Um, Forgive me, I'll take that too. No, no, sorry. Yeah. No. I, I had a question which is more sure. pressing on what, uh, pressing towards what Ben had said. Is there a, I guess, a common uh, posture on BRICS, particularly on the rise of new conflicts and this sort of counter-terrorism approaches? Is there a, a common sort of 
approach that they, they, they're taking, uh, thinking about new and emerging conflicts, but also counterterrorism as well. Is that something that is clear from the research that you've done? I think a lot really depends on, on the context. So I wouldn't... I mean, all, or it's very general. I mean, there is reference to rules-based international order, uh, non-violent responses to conflict, but this is very general. So I'm not sure how much I would trust that rhetoric then. <laughs> if the situation becomes extreme enough, then you would see different responses then. So, and then... Um, thank you very much. Um, my name's um, Ewan Grant. I'm a former law enforcement intelligence analyst. Uh, most of my work since has been in the ex-Soviet states in the Middle East. Um, in other words, in areas where border control and transnational criminality can't be entirely separated from security and peacekeeping. And so um, my colleague has worked in South Sudan. My question follows on from points you made about how proximity now also includes interconnectivity and also the reality of troops and presence and capabilities following economic presence, particularly in Africa. Um, where do you see who is listening to you and who do you think in the West is listening to the issue of Africa and the new tech methods or the new technologies? It's, it's a hard question. I'm not sure I can really answer that, but I don't think, you know, in, in, in the West, if you, if you live in Africa, the, the feeling is not that you are topping the agenda in many other countries in the world, <laughs> maybe your neighboring country, to, uh, to, be, uh, to be sure. Yeah, there's not, no, there's not much interest. If you look at technology penetration, of course, South Africa is uh, also uh, a big player with MTN, uh, with many brands in the, on, the, on the continent. Uh, but of course, critical mass. So, so the African investment is large. But other countries like uh, uh, also China, Japan. Um, the, the interesting part with China is really that they're taking much more risk in in their businesses, which Western companies do not want to take for many reasons. It's a different, yeah. It's, it's a different business model according to which the Chinese are operating. Yeah, that also makes it different, and it's, um, it's also avoiding. I mean, in the past, it was always about avoiding head-on competition with the key Western uh, uh, companies, which were in the past, I think, clearly more advanced. This is the gap is getting uh, is getting closer. And then, of course, um, uh, the the weight of China is now a completely different one than it was uh, 10 or 20 years ago. It is a very big topic, and I have to say, so when the European Union comes to us, and in Johannesburg we are the centre somehow, so we have many international guests, and it's not so self-evident anymore that the European Union, for instance, is the example for anything, and, and, and any, any any more. Uh, <laughs> that is a pretty... <laughs> this is. Uh, From the European Commission, I'm not necessarily yeah, saying uh, yeah. it's truly pathetic. Might be the problem of the EU itself, so that it has to think well, about <laughs> how it. <laughs> because it is a large player, it is still uh, very often the largest trading partner. It's not very often. It's not China. It's actually the European Union for many, for many African countries. But the rhetoric and uh, let's say the open diplomatic sphere in which we are all operating, then this has changed quite uh, dramatically. Uh, I would say in terms of technology penetration, I have almost no doubt that this will predominantly and for the future come rather from the east. Hello. Uh, I don't know, so I was, uh, I'm wondering what, if any, are the key differences in BRICS strategy for BRICS that are permanent 
No, important one, important one. Um, yeah, wh what's really interesting is that in doing the Libyan case, for instance, all BRICS members were also members of the UN Security Council. And if you, I was going through all the diplomatic statements and so on and so forth, and there was no coordination among them. <laughs> I, can, I, I can tell you. <laughs> um, the Chinese were totally passive. Not really. They they didn't really get what was going on uh, back then. Uh, this has changed through Libya because there was then afterward common agreement. Then okay, we feel bypassed. Okay, we can have a discussion if that perception is real <laughs> somehow. Because well, if you look at the main media back then, Americans clearly told us what they would do when there is a no-fly zone. I wasn't really an open, uh, it was more or less an open secret, but not really a secret. So sometimes I'm surprised about um, you know, how countries respond, but be this as it may. So there was no coordination at the beginning, maybe because the BRICS was new, the conflict was erupting very quickly, there was no background mechanism for close coordination, uh, actually. So it's not enough that heads of states are meeting, you also need to have this close network at different levels. And if these networks are not established, um, in 2012 I was at the South African delegation in, in, in New York, you know, these are 12 people. 12. You know, look at the American delegation. Uh, so obviously <laughs> capacity <laughs> come, comes, uh, comes in. So uh, diplomatic capacity counts as, um, counts as well. Okay, then for Syria, gradually, you know, uh, okay, we started with BRICS, but of course the non-permanent mem members had to drop out. And what you can clearly see is that, well, the IPSA initiative came at the beginning, in 2011, 2012, I think. But then all the IPSA countries leaving the Security Council also means that in the end uh, China and Russia were taking over, and in the end it was just Russia. Uh, so, um, yeah, in the Security Council, I guess countries are pretty egoistic in, in, in the end. So groupings do exist, but they don't really count that much um, um, after, um, after all. I've also, in the book, I'm also going through voting patterns, um, also in the General Assembly. And you do see deviations as well. So there is a division between IPSA and China and Russia towards many, many conflicts. So IPSA countries are on average, I would say, more multilateral, more going with the stream, with this China and Russia are uh, as large as global powers as they want to be, um, are more independent, um, some, somehow looking for, for, their own, uh, for their own way. So yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> So if they, I mean, South Africa is in the Security Council right now, and there is a debate uh, about you know uh, what to do with that position right now, uh, because we have more contestation between the U.S. and China. So where is the place for just a small elective member uh, in in here? And mm, there is a lessons learned that okay, just aligning towards one group is something that we try to avoid if possible. But if you can, you really avoid that. Uh, for the non-permanent members, you are really so disadvantaged strategically uh, with all the procedures, not just the veto and so on, pen holding power and, and, and so on, that there's not much space left in the end. And I think the US-China contestation as well as Russia is making this even more complicated for the non-permanent ones uh, to, to leave anything. There's some innovation about um, joint uh, presidencies, Germany, France, but the uh, question is, is there much substance in that? Can that be a role model for others as well? I haven't really seen much innovation in terms of procedures and so on. I'll take the last two questions. So if you want to go on then. More concrete on web crisis action. So I'm, you spoke a bit about the role of China in uh, South Sudan. I'm just wondering if you can see South Africa playing um, a significant role in the peace process or more generally conflict resolution in the future in South Sudan and in what ways, if so. And I'll take the last question yeah. as well. Did you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Mark, you're South African High Commission. Uh, you're talking about the, the backyards. I think the one backyard that is maybe quite vague is, is, is Africa. Uh, you talk about linkages, etc. Now, with, with many of the BRICS countries, I mean, especially China, India, Russia as well, having increasing interest, economic interest, and military interest, 
Хорошо. So yeah, let, let me first uh, respond to the South Sudan and then South Africa question. Yeah, I mean, Thabo Mbeki was of course uh, involved and then, um, but it's not, I mean distance also matters on the African continent of course, <laughs> and proximity and it's, uh, of course South Africa is most influential in, within the SADC region, uh, there it's the largest power economically, politically, uh, of course there's also also issues here and there, but um, as, as, I mean, this is uh, in terms of economic interest. The um, Saab Miller was have investing in, in the brewery <laughs> in South Sudan. That was the largest investment uh, South African uh, defense industry at some point. South Africa was the largest exporter of uh, military equipment to South Sudan. Uh, at some point, yes. yeah, yeah, at Very some many, point. Many uh, it's not the main exporter now, uh, uh, for instance, but it, I wouldn't overrate this, actually. It's still like some armored vehicles um, that are expensive, then all, all of a sudden you climb up uh, the rankings here and there. Um, yeah, in terms of peacekeeping, um, the, the problem for South Africa is, is clearly that the army is not in a state where it can take on more tasks. Actually, it's really in a state of decline also because of budget constraints here. So the South African role is rather declining and I don't really see it expanding that much in, in this particular region. Also because it is also a contested region in, 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 in Eastern Africa. So you have other neighboring African neighboring countries uh, that are more, uh, Uganda, etc., that are playing a very active role. The IGAD Protection Force, Ethiopia, and and so on. And these countries are also supported by the US, for instance, or European Union, and, and so on, and other countries. So they, I don't think that there is that much space. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. So South Africa has to come to terms with its own relative decline. Uh, over the last 10 years during the Duma administration and uh, might or will hopefully claim back some territory <laughs> at, at some point, but it will be somehow um, somehow limited, I, I guess. Oh, yeah, on, I mean, each BRICS summit um, also has outreach uh, events. I mean, for South Africa in 2013 uh, being the first country hosting a BRICS summit on the African continent and inviting so many African leaders to it, uh, I think what's important um, would be interesting to look at what is the legacy of all of, all of this, right? So um, some African countries I think are a little bit jealous about South Africa being at BRICS and the G20, while other large African countries in terms of economies and population do not play that particular role. So there's sometimes a bit of an uneasiness with South Africa being the only African country there. <laughs> um, that is um, um, that is clear, but uh, I think it's still important because other can other BRICS countries are doing the same thing within their own uh, within their own region. But I'm not again. My problem would be okay. What kind of legacy is there apart from okay? These were nice meetings somehow and kind of uplifting uh, yourself. Uh, it's a of course, the prestige is involved um, in this, but I have to say it's. I, I yeah, it's a bit difficult 
to go to the to the substance uh, there. But I'm also no expert on the economic side, so I have to be uh, I have to be uh, um, uh, careful in here. But of course, the importance of South Africa being in BRICS is that really you can't really talk about global order questions if Africa is not included in in here, huh? right? And uh, from that perspective, which is a decolonial perspective, a developmental perspective. I think that is important for Africa to be represented at least through one country in an important group like this. Uh, again, the, sp the specific substance is hard to really pin down to something. Yeah, so I, I, I think I can't, I can't do that um, actually. But on that more global level, you know, BRICS without an African country would simply not be able to use that high-flying language of global governance changes and so on if you exclude more than a billion of people. Brilliant. Uh, that brings us to the end of this discussion. Uh, can we please join me in thanking Dr. Martin for having us, uh, giving us this insightful 